Coming up on DTNS, Jeff Bezos is going to Washington. Intel builds anti-malware into its chips, and GitHub changes master to main. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 15th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Welcoming back to the show, Adobe Spark product manager, Veronica Belmont. Hello. So happy to be here. We were just having a good time on Good Day Internet uh, talking to Veronica about me going to the mall. <laughs> how Thrilling odd content. Yeah. And how odd that was. Thrilling mall content. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lots more stuff comes in Good Day Internet. Become a member. Get that show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Walmart and Shopify announced a partnership to add 1,200 Shopify sellers to Walmart's third-party marketplace by the end of this year, 2020. Walmart's marketplace will remain invite-only with all sellers vetted by the company. In Q1, Walmart's marketplace grew at a faster pace than Walmart's own overall web business. WhatsApp users in Brazil can now send and receive money using Facebook Pay. Transactions will require a PIN or biometric authentication, but you don't have to pay a commission fee unless you're a business. Businesses will pay a 3.99% processing fee to receive payments. Users can link their WhatsApp account with a Visa, MasterCard, or debit card, and local partners at launch include Banco do Brasil, Nubank, and Sicredi. ByteDance announced it plans to shut down two of its apps, Vigo Video and Vigo Lite, across all of its markets, having already shuttered the apps in Brazil and countries in the Middle East. These apps allowed users to create and share short-form sketches and lip-syncing to Bollywood songs. ByteDance says that it will help migrate videos over to TikTok before they're shut down in October. According to mobile analysts, the apps had 5.5 million monthly active users in India. The Apple Card now offers 0% financing for 12 months on Macs and iPads. I feel like I'm doing a car commercial suddenly. <laughs> uh, with six months financing on AirPods, uh, those purchases still qualify for your 3% cash back on Apple purchases. Uh, and accessories bought with iPads or Macs are included in the 12-month financing window. Apple Watch, however, is not included. Apple launched 24-month 0% financing for iPhone purchases back in December. Apple also announced it will start start selling a solid-state drive upgrade kit for the Mac Pro. The kit will let consumers upgrade the Mac Pro to 8 terabytes of storage. The company also announced you can now get the 16-inch MacBook Pro with the Radeon Pro 5600M card, which offers 6 gigabytes of HBM2 memory and a claimed 75% performance boost over the 4G 5500M cards. The U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration announced the Automated Vehicle Transparency and Engagement for Safe Testing, or AV-TEST, initiative. That creates a voluntary online platform for sharing automated driving system on-road testing activities. The upshot here is they want to eventually provide the public with testing locations and activity data for autonomous vehicles, so you can see what's actually going on with them. Uh, among the participants at launch will be Fiat Chrysler, Toyota, GM owned Cruise, Uber, Waymo, and the states of California, Florida, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Texas. Norway's data protection agency asked that the country's contact tracing app be suspended by June 23rd because of threats to user privacy. The Norwegian Institute of Public Health disagreed with that evaluation, but will indeed disable GPS and Bluetooth in the app as of June 16th and delete user data, quote, as soon as possible. And the Microsoft Insider program is changing from the ring model of slow ring, fast ring, and release preview ring. A new system will have a dev channel that replaced the fast ring, uh, and that won't be tied to a release. It'll have new features on OS improvements as they become available. The beta ring will replace the slow ring. I'm sorry, the beta channel will replace the slow ring. That'll have a reliable version of features tied to a particular upcoming release. And then the preview channel is just renaming the preview ring uh, and adds some support from Microsoft as well. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Mr. Bezos. Oh, let's. Amazon told Politico that the CEO, Jeff Bezos, is willing to testify before the U.S. House Judiciary Committee on the issue of antitrust. 
Amazon sent a letter to the House committee on Sunday. Antitrust hearings are scheduled for July. Now, according to letters seen by Axios, the U.S. House Judiciary Committee contacted Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, and Facebook to seek voluntary testimony from their CEOs and documents as part of a larger probe into big tech competitive concerns. These letters also suggested that subpoenas would be used to produce documents and testimony if not offered voluntarily. Mm. Yeah, so one of the hangups here was that Bezos uh, said, they were saying that Bezos was not the guy to talk about whether third-party data from other merchants was used or not. But I, I think they've, they've now walked back to realizing that it's just probably good for them to have the CEO at least show his face, even if they have other people also testify. So some of this is around their treatment of competitive products, competitive companies, and how they appear on the platforms, correct? Yeah, that's the third-party data that I was talking about, the where they like data. take third parties from their platform who've sold things right. and say, like, like oh, that's selling well, let's make one of those. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really curious to see how this kind of plays out because I think this is something that people in the industry have been watching for a really long time. And I mean, we know they have the data. We know that they like kind of why wouldn't they use it at this point? I mean, I can't imagine that they're so on such a moral high ground that they that they wouldn't, at least in some departments, be looking at that data and talking across groups to kind of figure out how best to use it. But I don't, that's just my opinion, but I, I'm curious to see how they defend against that. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm with you, Veronica. There there have been instances that we've talked about, at least on this show in the past, where it's like yeah, Amazon executives saying, well, you know, we don't always know what employees are doing. Those employees might have mm -hmm. been doing bad things, but we certainly didn't sanction it. Is that true? Well, we don't know, but... You, it, when a company gets to a certain size, you start to roll your eyes a little bit when when you hear stuff like that. I think also somebody like Jeff Bezos saying, "Well, I, you know, I I don't want to go testify. Do I have to? <laughs> I don't. If I don't have to, I don't want to do it." After a while, again, the perception of the public, whether or not you have a variety of really good reasons for not doing so, it makes it look like you have something to hide. So, mm -hmm. you know, at that point, you kind of you just got to do it. He's like, don't yeah. I pay people to do this? To Veronica's point, I think it'll be interesting if they come clean about what they do use and what they don't. Because you're right. There are some things that they do use. And I think Amazon will try to say, there are things we know about general trends on our platform. Of course, we pay attention to those. But we don't look at individual companies' data. Uh, we do keep that separate because it that's probably private. anonymized. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I can I, see it being anonymized. And I think they'll probably come come with that kind of defense. Last year, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission completed an 18-month investigation into how digital platforms were affecting media competition in the country. The report called for the creation of a voluntary code of contact conduct that would see platforms negotiate in good faith with news media to pay to use their content, advise news media of algorithm changes ahead of time, favor original sources over people quoting original sources, and share data back to the news people. Now, some of these were not controversial to the platforms, but some of them were. Submissions from the news industry called for platforms, particularly Facebook and Google, to either pay a centralized license fee that would be allocated to organizations based on the cost of making news, not on usage, on how much mm -hmm. they had to spend to make news. Uh, that's why News Corp wanted it that way. Uh, or sometimes up to 10% of the company's revenue in the country. Uh, that would be around $411 million United States. This code was set to be finalized in November, but in April, the Australian government tasked the Regulatory Commission with creating a mandatory code after limited success with early negotiations. That code followed the same basic principles of the voluntary code, but added penalties and binding dispute resolution mechanisms. In response to the initial draft of these mandatory rules, Facebook has rejected many of the draft rules, stating it has healthy competition with news organizations, and there would not be significant impacts on its business if it stopped sharing news altogether. Google Australia's managing director, Mel Silva, also wrote that the direct and indirect value of news to the company is, quote, very small. Facebook said both it and Google were being unfairly singled out, because they're the only ones mentioned, by name, and proposed an Australian Digital News Council as an alternative that would mediate complaints from news organizations based on the Australian Press Council as a model, rather than creating a separate regulatory body. Now, what I haven't been able to pin down for sure is, 
if they're talking about Facebook having to pay to use news in a Facebook news section, like the one they mm -hmm, just launched, mm -hmm. or if they mean everybody sharing on Facebook. Because if they mean everybody sharing on Facebook, I don't know, first of all, how you stop that. And second of all, that is material to Facebook's business. But if they're just talking about like when Facebook posts a news post, that's different, or when Facebook promotes it, et cetera. Certainly in Google's case, we've seen this happen before. In Spain, they just got rid of Google News. They said, fine, we yeah. just won't do it at all. First of all, two, two thoughts. One, I'm totally okay with Facebook just not showing any news on its platform. That would be fine with me. Two, they could definitely do some kind of block list or deny list around certain news domains to prevent those from being shown on the platform pretty easily to get around those. So that's one way that they could definitely stop the sharing of potential news sources. Yeah, this is, you know, we've seen this across various markets. You know, the, the fact that a company like Facebook is like, well, it doesn't even really matter if we do this or not, but we'd like you to completely <laughs> so rethink petty. the regulatory body that you put together in order, you know, for us to be a little bit more compliant with, you know, with the uh, pu publishers and, and what their, their values are as well is a little, I don't know if it's silly. It just, it seems, I, I, I don't know how you are really working with a government organization when you go about it this way. Agreed. Well, I don't know how much we agree about Quibi, but let's talk about Quibi anyway. The Wall Street Journal sources say that the streaming service Quibi is on pace to sign up less than 2 million users by the end of its first year in operation under the company's original target of 7.4 million. So that's quite a bit under, in fact. According to the analytics firm Sensor Tower, Quibi had 3.8 million downloads as of June 7th. After hitting a reported peak of 379,000 downloads on its April 6th launch, gosh, was that already April? All right. Mm. Seems like a long time ago. The streaming service did not exceed 20,000 downloads for any single day in the first week of June. At the end of May, 1.5 million users signed up for a 90-day free trial, which began, which began ending early in early July. So you're starting to see people drop off because they're, 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 their trials are ending. Since its founding in 2018, the company has raised $1.75 billion, but estimates Whoa. that by Q3 of this year, uh -huh, it will have spent $1 billion of those $1.75 billion, including a budgeted $350 million on content in 2019. So sounds like Quibi needs to raise more money or really rethink some well, things. Um, yeah, uh, so, if the, so the trials will start ending in July. The 90-day trials will start ending in July. When that happens, two things will happen. They'll either start making money off people who forget to cancel, which will probably happen in, to certain Or people extent. who like the product and stay. Uh, or, or <laughs> also, I guess there are people who like the product and stay. You're you right. You will also Absolutely. make money off of enthusiastic users. No, it's fair. Just it's fair. That That's there. A, there's, there are people who like Quibi and will uh, will willingly stay. Uh, but one expects a large number of people to cancel, in which case they not only lose that potential subscription revenue, but those eyeballs as well. Now, yeah, a lot of those people yeah. weren't watching it anyway, uh, but the people who have been watching it are generating advertising revenue. And that was the other thing is Quibi sold a lot of advertising up front. Uh, they are not going to, uh, with these numbers, have the uh, volume to deliver the impressions that they promised. Yeah, we don't know anything about what their monthly active users looks like, their, their DAU. We don't know like how many people, what their return rates are. We don't know. There's probably a lot of churn. It's just there's there's so many questions. Um, these numbers obviously tell a pretty bad story about the the, the rate of new sign-ins and, and account creations. But I don't know how you raise money with that kind of trend. Um, but yeah, I think there will be more information coming when we start seeing those those trials end and, and see if people do stick on. Because if they can if they can make some kind of sustainable, tell some kind of sustainable story about their about their their usage, that might help them. But it it doesn't look good. Well, and the whole Quibi thing, you know, again, some some pretty bad timing just on the part of the world, um, being like, we're a mobile first company. You're not going to be able to cast to televisions. And people were like, that's crazy. No one can leave their home. All right, well, let's figure out how to let you cast to your they televisions. Fixed it. Chromecast and last yeah, week, and so, Apple TV. And so, you know, we might we might see, you know, the uh, the, the the tide turn a little bit, but you know, I don't know. With a fickle audience, I it it's it doesn't look 
good. Maybe they should have called it omakase, which is another thing in this story. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> Intel announced plans to build anti-malware directly into its CPUs. Tiger Lake mobile chips will be the first to integrate something called Control Flow Enforcement Technology, or CET, which was jointly developed by Intel with Microsoft. Now, bear with me here. CET addresses something called Return Oriented Programming, or ROP. ROP was the bad guy, the malware maker's response to something called Executable Space Protection and Address Space Layout Randomization, or ESP and ASLR. Those stopped malware from making changes to system memory. So ROP came around and started hijacking functions that were already in memory. Malware makers said, oh, you're gonna keep us from getting into the memory? Fine, we'll find things that are already in the memory and manipulate those, essentially mm. reordering when the functions ran, which would return information to the malware. So one way CET blocks ROP is a shadow stack. Whoa. Say that five times fast. Uh, shadow stack makes a copy of the order of operations that are executed in a CPU for each app. That way, when the ROP, when the malware makers try to manipulate the order the functions run in to gain information, the CPU looks at it oh and says, God, uh, uh. not the right order, <laughs> and stops executing the program. CET also defends against other attacks like jump-oriented programming, call-oriented programming. Uh, Intel released the CET specifications back in 2016 in order to give app makers time to update the apps that support them. And Windows Insider builds already include support in the operating system. The operating system has to support this for it to work. Intel says it plans to integrate CET across desktop and server platforms as well. Yeah, got nothing to say about that. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's good. It's good. To, let's just give Intel credit. They've been getting a lot of heat for the side channel uh, execution vulnerabilities, which Intel is not the only chip maker to suffer from. Uh, and those, but those side channel vulnerabilities keep on coming. Uh, this is this is something that I think is a a better fix for arguably a more widespread pro problem. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. any company who's like, we're going to build anti-malware into our CPUs. My first reaction is, great, let's all do that. Uh, are there any sort of glaring issues that anyone sees with this? It's like, no, I mean, moving it in the right direction. Yeah. The real silver blade in our, our Twitch chat, uh, which by the way, Twitch is back up, uh, says, wouldn't malware makers just work around this? And it's like, yeah, uh, it's, they'll come up with something the way ROP was a workaround race. of ASLR. Yeah. Uh, but this is a good fix. This is a good move in that continuing arms race. A company calling itself Open Core Computer launched a PC called Velociraptor. It's a really great name for a PC, which it also says comes pre-installed with Mac OS Catalina and Windows 10 Pro. Yeah. Open Core is only accepting Bitcoin as payment, so some eyebrows have been raised. Apple's end user license agreement forbids third-party installations of its software, and any commercial Mac clone is a violation of that agreement, as well as the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Apple sued and won a permanent injunction against the company Psystar uh -huh. back in 20, uh, 2009 for selling Hackintoshes. Ah, hearkening back to a yeah. former era. The makers of the open core bootloader, that's the open source project Acid in Thera, said they're in no way affiliated with this company. And they called it shocking and disgusting. And yeah. this was very confusing to me when I read it this morning. Um, yeah. So if, you're, if anyone else is confused, it's, you know, there's quite a few companies that are doing things or not doing things right now. And, and, and I, I know that, that clearly, um, the open core bootloader folks are like, we don't, don't bring us into this. We didn't yeah. do this. Open core bootloader is an open source project. It is meant to allow, uh, you to make a Hackintosh, but it doesn't actually break any uh, of the the terms or anything. It's just a tool that you can use or not use. And they they try to be very ethical about it. Whereas Open Core Computer is trading on that Open Core Bootloader name uh, to probably get a little bit of goodwill. And I think that's why the folks who make Open Core Bootloader are very upset yeah. by this. Yeah, that makes sense. Man, I haven't heard the name Psystar in a long time. Brings that's you kind back. of exciting. <laughs> <Back>. <laughs> yeah. 
And, and you know, Hackintoshes, there's a lot of argument about whether you should be allowed to make your own Hackintosh, and that's where the open core bootloader people work, is like empowering users. Open core computer, by saying like, oh, we're not breaking the rules because we're hiding your purchase in Bitcoin, uh, that seems pretty shady to me. Don't know about you. Uh, yeah. I am, um, of all of the kind of back and forth that I've seen online from folks, it all ends up coming back to, well, if Apple just made their computers cheaper, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't totally know how this ends up. You know, Apple's going to go after any company who's doing something like this as brazenly as it is now. But it, you know, it's, it's, I think these things keep cropping up until, uh, you know, the, the, the faithful are, are happier with their products. Yeah. Or if, if Apple opened up the uh, operating system a little more beyond just the Darwin. Or that, OS, or yeah. that, and yeah. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Google Chrome developer Una Kravitz posted on Twitter last week, uh, quote, for what it's worth, I'm super happy to rename the default branch structure of master to main, and I hope we can all do this together as a community with GitHub leading the charge by implementing it in their products moving forward. The reason for that is the master branch uh, kind of calls up the master slave Ter terminology in technology. Uh, it's often used by, for, for client server situations. And Una Kravitz was saying, look, if this makes anybody uncomfortable, if it brings up associations with slavery, it's easy to call it main. Let's do this. GitHub CEO Nat Friedman responded, it's a great idea and we are already working on this. And he at replied CTO Billy Griffin in his response of GitHub. Now, keep in mind, there's GitHub, the company, and there's Git, the open source mm -hmm. project. So you've got a little bit of that open core uh, confusion going on again. So those are two different organizations. Uh, and developers in either can choose their names for various versions and branches of projects, but GitHub has a default. Uh, that often is what people use because it's the default, and like we all do. Sometimes you look at the default and you're like, yeah, that's fine. So the open source Git project is considering switching the default uh, from master to main to denote the main branch of a repository. GitHub sounds like they're going to go ahead and do that, which would sort of lead the way on the issue. The move comes as a bunch of other projects also work to remove terms from code libraries that may sound racially insensitive. Uh, Android Open Source Project, Go Programming Language, Grammarly, and the Curl Download Utility are among those who have all changed whitelist and blacklist to allow list and block list. LinkedIn developer Gabriel Sapo said on Twitter he is working to update Microsoft's internal software libraries to make similar changes. And Drupal is one of the organizations that did this a while ago. Drupal CMS project adopted uh, the, the primary replica language to replace master slave back in 2014. Veronica, I know you, you brought this up because uh, you, you deal with this kind of terminology in your job all the time. Yeah, I think uh, I'm personally, I, I, I kind of came up with this earlier today. I don't know if anyone else is using this, but I like go list and no list. Oh, that's nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, just, it makes it easier than saying like allow or deny for some reason, go list or no list. Um, but I think it's a really great trend. I think it's it. It does seem rather trivial um, in terms of the amount of work it goes into renaming these things and, and the amount of, of good that it can do in, in making companies and projects more inclusive uh, and welcoming to a lot of people who maybe didn't feel that way and felt uncomfortable when those terms were being used and with good reason. Um, so I'm really happy to, to see those changes. I know Adobe's doing this with some of our open source projects as well. Um, I hope that continues even further on the technology end of the spectrum um, with what we're doing. So yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely become aware of it now when I hear it uh, more and more. But as you know, uh, as you mentioned, Drupal has been doing this since 2014. And I think there's been a lot of conversations happening in the, the developer communities about this. And there's been a lot of pushback. Um, and I think that pushback, it, it seems so silly to me because like I said, it, from a technology perspective, it's not difficult to do. It's just the naming of things. Um, and so going back and making those changes, not, not super difficult. And it just seems like people get really set in their ways, in the ways they like to do things. And they make excuses sometimes as well. I've heard a lot of the arguments about how master in a lot of instances when it's not something like like forking a repro or repo or whatever is more uh, referring to like a master recording 
But at the end of the day, to me, it doesn't really matter because if that thing makes people feel unwelcome in the technology world, it, it, it shouldn't be even a conversation. At this right. Point. It doesn't really, it's, it's, it's a, it's a title for something that does a thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, you Who change cares? the title, the thing still does the thing and people are happier. It's hard to argue. Well, hold on. This is the way that we used to do it before. Let's all, you know, let's, you know, stop being so PC because I think that there is a lot of, it, there is a lot of sentiment of like, oh, that's not what this means. This is just yeah. tech stuff. Um, and, and maybe you do feel that way, but if people don't feel that way, and again, like, you know, inclusion is such a big topic in our industry. Mm-hmm. Why, why not? Cause it's such an easy fix. And like you Words said, matter, like go you know? or no. Yeah. It's like, just say that nothing changes. Why yeah, people the, are still going to know downside, what you're talking about. <laughs> the downside could be if we don't agree on on the right, the, the, the new term, right. It's going to yeah. cause confusion if everybody's using different things when everybody used the same thing before. So you I, do have to, context, you do, I don't think it really does matter that much. You do have to con- come to a consensus on that or, or it will, it will cause some temporary confusion, but I imagine that consensus will coalesce. Uh, and then there's also the, the determination of, well, where is the line? Where are the things that you don't change? Uh, I think client slave slave drives, uh, I think those are pretty obviously bad, right? Like, the, the I would I, say I, so. I, yeah, I, I have talked to people who are like, yeah, I was uncomfortable building PCs because I had to talk about the slave drive and the and the and the you know the master slave terminology really bothered me. Uh, and so I think those are those are worth changing, even if there's a, a little bit of of a of a rough bump in trying to figure out what we all agree. Uh, the new change is. And and if you have enough momentum, which it seems like maybe you do, certainly at GitHub, uh, it should be easy to get on the same page about what the new terminology is at the yeah. end. I'll just say, if people are smart enough to make computers and build these systems, people are smart enough to figure out what is going to work and what to use and what to change. Now, it brings up a question for us, and I don't want to get too navel-gazing here, but our, we have two Patreon levels, one called Master, which is named after the the idea of like a master's degree, a mastery of something. Uh, and we have a name called Grandmaster, which was suggested by Lamar Wilson after chess grandmasters. Uh, and so, you know, doing this story today has made us double look at this. Sarah brought this up last week, to be honest, but but we're thinking like, is is this on the side of the line? We're like, no, it's too far removed. It really won't bother people, or does it? Uh, so we we do want to hear from you feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com about that. We're listening. Absolutely. You can also join the conversation in our Discord, which happens 24-7. And you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Oh, Dewey, one of our DTNS bosses, wrote in and said, this past week, you explained the changes coming to HBO apps. At the time, it seemed to make sense. But I've discovered a problem affecting me and maybe a few others. Soon, HBO Go will go away, and HBO says it will be replaced by HBO Max. This is for people like me who subscribe to HBO with their cable TV provider. Unfortunately... This only works if your provider is signed up to support HBO Max. My provider is Frontier. I took over the fiber octet service for Verizon Fios here in Florida and several other states. I downloaded the HBO Max on my Apple TV. When you run it, it gives you a code, asks you to log in with your provider. Unfortunately, Frontier Communications, not on the list like it was for HBO Go. The net result is I will be losing the ability to watch HBO on my iOS and Apple TV devices, even though I pay for it with my cable service. I just love it when I have things taken away from me when I'm paying for them. Yeah, uh, there are a few examples where, uh, you know, it's not a majority of HBO users, but because there's a dispute between the companies and they can't come to an agreement, people like Dewey get lost. Uh, What HBO would tell you is easy fix cancel HBO through Frontier and sign up with HBO Max directly uh, and then you'll get it. But then you wouldn't have it on your Frontier TV system, would you? And now, then I think HBO would say, well, you might want to think about changing your TV system. So this oh. this is when they're trying to use users as leverage between each other and uh, poor Dewey gets caught in the middle. I'm well, so confused up. about everything. Oh, I mean, sorry. No, it's, <laughs> None of it it's makes fine. any sense to me. I give up. <laughs> I, I, anything HBO these days, I'm like, wait, what, what are you subscribed? I don't know. I, I just, you know, I like a lot of your content. You 
jerks. A shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Dan Colbeck, Erwin Stur, and Justin Zellers. Also, a big thanks to Veronica Belmont for being with us. After all of this time, we really missed you. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, uh, gosh, um, Veronica Belmont is really just a little portal page for all the stuff that I'm doing right now. Um, Sword and Laser, of course, still going strong after what twelve years? I don't even oh, know gosh, at this yes. point. I'm um, so we're we're still cranking out Sword and Laser every other week. Um, super fun and Spark. Yeah, the project that I work on in Adobe is called Adobe Spark, and you can check it out at spark.adobe.com. Also, folks, you can sow support for Daily Tech News Show at any level by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. There's lots of perks for thanking you if you find value in the show. Uh, we just ask that you give a little value back there. And uh, we also support the show through some merch. Uh, you know, we got hats, we got sweatshirts. We know not all of you want a mask, but if you do, uh, we've got them in the DTNS store right now. Who wouldn't want to walk around with a DTNS logo on their face? Come on, uh, go check it out, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. And if you got feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you'd like to join us live, well, guess what? We are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson as our guest. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>